All of us in the creative field have had individuals we were inspired by or taught us something through an artistic channel that has given us a perspective or newly discovered method of acquiring noteworthy awareness. When someone works with their own ideas of what makes art unique and doesn't stick to any checklist of what is digestible by the public is an extremely commendable thing. The people we look up to unavoidably strike a nerve of originality and revelation. For myself, this person was Harmony Corrine. Hi and welcome back to If Looks Could Kill. Today we will be dissecting the life and career of Harmony Corrine. Harmony Corrine is an American filmmaker, photographer, author, screenwriter and contemporary artist who has made a name for himself with his many strange and thought-provoking motion pictures he has made over the years. Growing up, Harmony was fascinated by those who stood out or were considered freaks of nature or on the brink of society. Certain images or people he would come across made a profound impact on him at a young age and led him down a creative route of artistry where he strived for some kind of outlet. His father was an accomplished documentary maker so cinema was always in his life and the craft ended up flowing naturally into his adulthood. In Harmony's late teens, he was often seen hanging around skate parks in New York City and became immersed in that culture. One day, a 19-year-old Harmony was approached by Larry Clark in a park inhabited by skaters, and after telling him that he had been writing independent screenplays, Larry asked him to write a feature-length script about New York City street kids. Harmony took a brief amount of time to write the script and gave it to Larry who loved the script's brash, atmospheric and disturbing quality. Larry took Harmony's script and shot every scene the way it was written, which is quite surprising since the film's final product seemed like every scene was improvised and fully authentic. The film, titled Kids, was released in 1995 and sparked controversy, divided critics and viewers, but made its impact and a clear statement about the dangers of the youth of America at the time. A while back I did a video on Larry Clark's early filmography, so I'll link that video in the description if you want to know more in depth about Kids. Harmony began to gain immediate notoriety after his first writing credit was one of the most talked about films that came out in the summer of 1995. Soon after this, Harmony took the initiative to create his own seminal masterpiece that became his directorial debut. In Nashville, Tennessee during 1997, Harmony and his crew of mostly unprofessional actors assembled one of the most lively, fascinating and non-conforming movies of the century. Gummo follows the lives of residents of small town Xenia, Ohio following the aftermath of a tornado. The film alternates between multiple characters and their lives roaming about this location and what they get up to on their day-to-day -day lives. The most common meaning of the word gummo refers to people that are seen as redneck or white trash, so that is the kind of community that this film is trying to encapsulate. In 1997, the imager in this film and the subject matter it includes, such as molestation, poverty, satanism and animal cruelty made it groundbreaking and pushing a boundary that previous films had failed to reach. This film has held up tremendously well and is never forgotten about because of its use of setting and imagery that manages to burn the way into the minds of its viewers and live with them forever. It's the casual insanity of this film that gives the viewer a sense of disorientation because the characters never express shame or disappointment in their actions or the position that they're in. The closest thing we get to a main character in Gummo is Solomon played by Jacob Reynolds who spends his days getting high off glue and hunting cats to sell to Chinese restaurants. A scene that appears towards the film's end captures the film's overall vibe where Solomon is bathed by his mother and fed spaghetti and chocolate while she washes his hair. The attention to detail in this scene alone is something to appreciate such as the mutilated dolls by the shower head or the piece of bacon that Silla taped to the wall behind Solomon's head. Honestly, the best way to enjoy Gummo is to go in with the open idea of letting someone with creative freedom indulge in their obscure love for showcasing a reaction-provoking vision. The main thing I appreciate about Gummo is how it highlights the strange charm or beauty about the simple life and how someone can make a piece of work so impactful with such inexperienced actors which ultimately led to a final product that felt more pure and genuine. For a lot of Harmony's late teens and early adult life, he used drugs and hallucinogens to spark an idea or style that would eventually be known as one of his pieces or a kind of trademark. Harmony was introduced to actress Chloe Sevigny on the set of Kids and the two began dating shortly after this. The two collaborated on Gummo and then in Harmony's second directorial, which brings us to 1999 when we got Julian Donkey Boy. A friendship on a personal and professional basis also began between Harmony and Werner Herzog, who was a well-renowned German documentary and filmmaker who would go on to play a part in Julian Donkey Boy alongside Chloe Sevigny. Julian Donkey Boy was Harmony's attempt at Dogma 95, 
which was a filmmaking movement developed in 1995 by Danish directors Lars von Trier and Thomas Vinterberg. Some of the rules are that sound must never be produced and only exist within the scene. 35mm is the only acceptable format. All shots must be handheld and the director must not be credited. The plot of Julian Donkey Boy is about a young man with schizophrenia and how this affects the relationship with his family and the others around him. Harmony wrote the film based on his uncle whom he constantly turned to in preparation when writing the film and had lead actor Ewan Bremner listen to audio tapes to gain insight into the role. Parts of this film act as a simulation for someone experiencing schizophrenia and is also when Harmony Korine began to experiment with his use of neon lighting patterns which would come into play later on in some of his more famous work. Werner Herzog plays the father of Julian, who is a rage-filled ex-soldier and who is not happy about his family's current situation. Chloe Sauvigny plays Pearl, who is the innocent sister, who we eventually discover is carrying the baby of her brother Julian. With the intimate shooting style, the family's relationship feels very real with its fluctuating moments of light humour to disturbing power dynamics between the characters. Julian Donkey Boy was the first American film to be certified Dogma 95 and has quite a traditional vibe because of this since there are no grand gestures or superficial scenes. At one point Macaulay Culkin was offered a role in the film since he and Harmony had previously collaborated on a music video for Sonic Youth but he was unprepared to start acting again so he ultimately turned down the part. There was a large gap of 8 years between Harmony's second and third directorial. Uh, one reason for this was Harmony's drug addictions to crack and heroin that eventually forced him to power through a rehab stint in order to get clean again. Another reason for his hiatus was his abandoned film project known as Fight Harm. Very little footage of this film has ever been made public, uh, but from what he has said in interviews it consisted of Harmony provoking random bypassers in the street until they would lash out and physically assault Harmony. His rule was that he would never throw the first punch but simply aggravate people he came across to the point where they couldn't help themselves but to lash out at the young director. Harmony's intention was to create the great American comedy and prove that there is malice and a sense of oppression in all aspects of humour. During production, Harmony ended up in hospital numerous times with broken legs and other injuries as well as serving jail time which greatly impacted production. After a long time of having the film be in production, Harmony gave up on the project since the process of filming was too torturous for him to stand and when he had all the footage of actual fights edited together, it didn't even add up to half the runtime he was aiming for. When trying to film these fight scenes, it became pure chaos because once the fight was over, someone on the production team would have to run over to the person in the fight and ask their consent to be filmed and the person would immediately feel sorry and express how they felt bad about beating up this young director. Harmony most likely has mixed feelings towards the footage of Fight Harm because of the trauma he suffered trying to have it made and the mental state he was in at the time of filming. He still might release the footage one day but he has said that the footage might not live up to the high expectation that people have built up in their mind over time. Harmony finally made a comeback after his 8 year hiatus and in 2007 we got Mr Lonely which was one of his most concise and whimsical films he's made in his entire career. This was Harmony's second collaboration with Werner Herzog following Julian Donkey Boy and followed the story of a young Michael Jackson impersonator who meets a Marilyn Monroe impersonator in Paris and they travel to a secluded area in Scotland full of other civilians living their lives every day as knockoff celebrities. There is also a plot parallel to this which involves nuns jumping out of airplanes in attempts to test their faith and ensure themselves of God's existence. Mr. Lonely is the closest thing we'll ever get to a family film by Harmony and is one of the most digestible films via mainstream audiences that we'll most likely ever see by Corrine. With the entire concept of impersonators living together in the secluded area, we see them living out of pure fantasy in their everyday lives. This has some obvious commentary about identity issues and living a life trying to replicate someone else's accomplishments instead of their own. Harmony shot the film in Scotland and France and has some of the best cinematography of his entire career. It's extremely different and juxtaposing to the look of Judy and Donkey Boy or Gummo and even the film he made after this. Mr. Lonely is the film that gets forgotten about when discussing the filmography of Harmony Korine, but is one of the most layered and complex films despite the linear story structure. This is a great film to introduce yourself into the work if you are unfamiliar with Harmony and if the likes of the previous film seemed a bit off-putting to you. At this point in his career, it seems like he might be moving towards a more traditional route of filmmaking, but it turned out to be the very opposite with what came next for Harmony. Just two years after Mr. Lonely, we got the fourth directorial by Harmony known as Trash Humpers. 
2009 brought us Harmony's arguably most divisive film since his early days on the scene. Trash Humpers is a VHS style film following the lives of multiple elderly people vandalizing their hometown and embracing the decay and destruction of the environment around them. An hour and 18 minutes of repetition, overblown dialogue, purposefully poor image quality makes for a viewing experience that won't be forgotten shortly after. Trash Humpers being shot in the style of an old fashioned VHS is important because Harmony wanted the final product to be like something you'd find floating down a river or in a ditch somewhere. Essentially the point of Trash Humpers is to express everything the basic rules of cinema go against such as decent cinematography or an engaging story. The whole idea for Trash Humpers came from a photography shoot that Harmony did and also an instance where he was walking along a street one night and came across a rubbish skip underneath a street lamp and it looked as though there was a theatre spotlight covering it and this gave Harmony the inspiration. For the sake of this video I re-watched Harmony's films in order to refresh myself in case I had forgotten anything but I just could not force myself to re-watch Trash Humpers because I've seen it once, I've sat through the whole thing and that's enough for me. Trash Humpers in my opinion is like Harmony's updated version of Gummo on a whole other level of insanity and an attack on the sensual experience of the viewer. The main similarities between the two is they both impose themes exploring American culture in its purest form in a style similar to a documentary. Shortly after Trash Humpers, Harmony began the development of his most ambitious project to date and some would say is the film that he is most famous for. Harmony wanted to make a film in the world of youthful pop culture but place it in a raw, dark and twisted reality. An early description for the film was a Britney Spears music video meets a Gaspar Noé film which is pretty fitting looking at the final product that we got. In mid-2013, we finally got the wide release of Spring Breakers, which immediately grabbed the attention of demographics from all over. The film was a chaotic but beautifully shot movie about the generation that was raised on violent media, over-sexualized imagery, and the entitlement that came with this. The actual plot of the film follows four naive young girls in university who commit a violent robbery in order to fund their wild and eventful spring break in Florida. James Franco plays the celebutante alien who is a drug dealer and rap artist who bails the four young girls out of jail after their arrest for possession and vandalism. Harmony wanted the film to speak to a certain generation from that period that were heavily influenced by the likes of MTV and other mediums that glamorized heavy drug use, sex and violence. In one of the most intelligent casting moves of the decade, Harmony got Selena Gomez, Vanessa Hudgens and Ashley Benson to play three of the four girls that the film follows. These actresses were part of the machine that manufactured the mindset of the youth of America at the time in 2013 and Harmony had essentially tricked the demographic into the cinema to see a dark perspective that was a reflection of themselves. The four girls in this film behave in the most provocative, malicious and unsympathetic way that is genuinely shocking at times and hard to look away from. The performances of Vanessa Hutchins and Ashley Benson in this film have a clear undertone of sociopathic tendencies and that gives the film its edge and embraces a certain female empowerment in a weird way. The two characters played by Vanessa Hutchins and Ashley Benson have clear mental issues and the film does a good job at showing how they don't perceive their actions as detrimental or consequential at all and the fake reality that they live in will simply go on forever. The movie has a very hallucinogenic feel to it, especially in the second half when it just becomes purely non-linear and takes a darker turn with every scene. Harmony goes full-fledged into his so-called liquid narrative style which just makes the film's chronology more of a choreographed structure that flows in a satisfying manner and makes rewatchability more valuable. Unfortunately, amongst my demographic, the consensus is that this film is boring and uneventful, which I couldn't disagree with more. Perhaps 2013 was too early for a film to be released that relied so heavily on art house value that starred Selena Gomez, James Franco and Vanessa Hudgens. One scene that was appropriately praised for its integrity and visual poetry is the sequence in which James Franco plays a version of Britney Spears' Every Time and this is accompanied by visuals of Alien and the girls committing violent crime in a stylishly shot and almost graceful way. When we look at what Britney Spears represents to this generation being a manufactured pop star adored by millions and what became of her career contrasted with these girls and what they strive for out of life has some strong and heavy connotations. In my opinion, the marketing for this film makes it look like a mainstream comedy more in line for the American Pie audience, which is one of the reasons why it's underappreciated by those who simply just don't understand it. I think this kind of poster, which I found online, 
I'm not sure if this is fan made or not, but I think it encapsulates the real vibe of the film a lot more than this does. The use of colours in this film alone to display the sense of realism versus the fantasy that the delusional characters cannot differentiate from is one of the best uses of a neon palette in recent years. In a nutshell, my thoughts on this film are just that, in my opinion, it's massively misunderstood as that weird film that over-sexualized Selena Gomez and Vanessa Hudgens instead of a social commentary on the early 2010s hypocritical pop culture. One last interesting tidbit about this movie is that early on in production, Emma Roberts was cast as Brit, but apparently had issues with the three-way sex scene between herself, Vanessa Hudgens and James Franco, and was replaced by Ashley Benson because of this. Seven years after Spring Breakers, we got The Beach Bum, which is of right now Harmony's most recent directorial feature. This film stars Matthew McConaughey, Isla Fisher, Zac Afron, and Snoop Dogg, which is, um, fitting, I guess. Harmony definitely went in a lighter direction with this film uh, compared to his previous. The aesthetic is quite similar with the setting and textures, but feels far less grounded in reality. What this film is, is essentially Harmony's take on a stoner comedy and follows Moondog played by McConaughey living his inherently luxurious life roaming around the Florida Keys without a care in the world. What they set out to do with this one was to make a film that wasn't to be taken seriously on any accounts. For the first 30 minutes of the film, it just feels like nothing is happening except Moondog's reckless antics and what his life entails but then we do go in a surprising change of direction when we get a more rounded story. What I appreciate about this film is how lively and colourful all the characters are. They all feel very in the style of Harmony Kareen and with them there's never a dull moment. During the film's limited theatrical run, apparently some cinemas around Los Angeles promised Harmony they would spread waves of cannabis smoke around the theatre to enhance the film's performance and viewing experience. That is all of Harmony's filmography to date, there definitely will be more as he is still very involved in productions. He's also made countless shorts over the years which are um nothing that you wouldn't expect from him. Even though all six of his films are strange and polarizing, I do have at least some appreciation for all of them. Even Trash Humpers I think has something noteworthy to add to the conversation, and there is a quality about how intentionally tasteless it is, while somehow feeling like it has taste and a certain amount of class at the same time. To me, his entire catalogue of work is what makes him so great, and the amount of material he's touched on over the years with such a personal and unique voice. Another reason for Harmony's well-known persona is because of the three appearances he made on David Letterman back in the 90s that put his name on the map. During these interviews on Letterman, he appeared to be out of it on something, but you could still see his passion and charm seeping through. Harmony was banned for life from the David Letterman show when he was supposed to return for a fourth interview, but was caught going through the personal belongings of Meryl Streep and was subsequently thrown out. Around this time, crack, heroin and other drugs most likely were a big factor of his odd behaviour, but they were also a reflection in his work and the films that he was creating. Most of his films have an hallucinogenic feel to them and have a clear influence of incorporating a fluctuating sensuality that brings the viewer on a full-fledged experiential journey for the 90 minute runtime. Harmony clearly does understand the impact that drugs and addiction can have on people's lives since he has gone through that experience and come out the other side. The attraction with the work by Harmony is that his films are about the feeling they induce in the viewer and the response that is inflicted by however they absorb the material. Audience members often write off his films as shallow and lacking substance, but the point is that he doesn't play by your rules and he goes with his own gut and instinct. Many of Harmony's films do have meaning and commentary behind them, but if you can't see this, it doesn't make the film a bad viewing experience, it just means that it didn't personally speak to you as how it might to others. The philosophy that revolves around Harmony Kareen is his ability to make people think and respond, and this is an excellent way of crafting your work and artistic value, whether that be film, music, poetry, etc, because the whole point is that it can make you feel things. Thank you so much for watching and listening to my thoughts on Harmony Kareen. I really appreciate you if you've made it this far since I packed so much into this video. This was a cathartic experience for me to release my thoughts and opinions on this man. So again, thank you very much for watching. I'd love to hear your thoughts on any of these movies, so please feel free to reach out if you'd like. I would appreciate it even more if you subscribed and looked out for more videos like this coming very shortly.